Welcome to Distribution Talk with Jason Bader, the show where we dive into the stories, struggles, and solutions from business owners and thought leaders in the wholesale distribution market. Hey, podcast listeners, Jason here. In this episode, I had the opportunity to catch up with John Marco Palazzo, president of Casco Safety. Casco is a safety products distributor based in Managua, Nicaragua. Now, John Marco has the distinction of being the first lead that I really ever got off of LinkedIn. And I got this uh, kind of funny message uh, from this gentleman. And, you know, hey, I'd like to talk to you about coming down and working with my company in Nicaragua. And, you know, my eyebrows are raised. I'm thinking, okay, my scam alert is going really at high levels at this point. I'm like, who is this guy? What's going on? But I agreed to meet him over Skype. And, you know, he's just a great guy, just a warm personality. And he won me over. Next thing I know, I'm on a plane down to Managua. And I'll tell you, I spent a few days down with them and really enjoyed working with him and his team and learning a little bit about the challenges that they have uh, as a an organization uh, in Central America. Anyhow, um, I love catching up with him and I think you'll enjoy the conversation as well. This episode of Distribution Talk is sponsored by InSQL Distribution Software. If you plan to be at the 2019 International Fastener Expo, be sure to visit InSQL Software in booth 1821. The expo is being held at the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. Remember, booth 1821 for software demonstrations, snacks, and free beer. Yes, you heard me right. Beer on tap. Now that I have your attention, they'll be showing their new CRM on smart devices. If you plan to be at the 2019 International Fastener Expo, you will not want to miss booth 1821 in SQL software built for distribution. All right, John Marco. Hey, thank you so much for coming on uh, Distribution Talk. Thanks a lot, Jason. Great to connect again. Yeah, absolutely. Now it's it's a pleasure uh, seeing your smiling face, and uh, unfortunately, the listeners don't get to see that. But <laughs> hey, at least I do, so I get yeah. to see you again. You know, if you wouldn't mind, take us back to uh, you know how you got involved in distribution. I know it's been kind of a long road, and yeah, if you wouldn't mind just kind of sharing uh, you know, your journey into distribution. Yeah, so I graduated college in 97 in Atlanta, Georgia Tech, and uh, I moved back to my origin, my my home country, Nicaragua, where I was born, but I actually never really lived there after one year old. So I moved back two weeks after graduation and started working with my father in, in agriculture. He had some coffee and rice farms. And I quickly realized that that wasn't going to go very far. <laughs> so uh, I started, you know, getting a little depressed. Uh, usually all my buddies had like jobs lined up and were working and in big cities and stuff. And uh, I was here in this sort of backward tropic country, really trying to figure myself out. And my brother-in-law, who at the time was the VP of international for a major safety equipment company, he offered me, he came down for Thanksgiving. He said, hey, why don't you distribute our, our gloves? And I said, honestly, I appreciate the offer, but I, I didn't go to university to be a glove salesman. And he's like, I know it's not very glamorous, but it's a great business. You should check it out. So uh, little did I know that there were so many gloves when he sent me a bag full of, a duffel bag full of samples and catalogs. <laughs> yeah. and, and my vision of the business really just started taking off. And uh, I had no clue really that it was an entire world. So I invested the $5,000 I had saved up from college internships, and uh, I started my own company at 21 years old, and uh, I've been an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur ever since. It's been a great ride with a lot of highs, a lot of lows, um, <laughs> but definitely that's what kicked it all off, and, and to this day, I still, that's one of the main brands, MCR Safety, that I sell here in the, in the region. Speaking of the university time, what did you think you were going to do? You know, rather than going out and going into distribution, being a glove salesman, what originally had you thought you were going to do before you decided to come uh, you know, back to your home country? Yeah, I always thought some sort of financial business was okay. something that was glamorous. and You got to wear shiny shoes and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Get, you know, work in a high rise and things like that. And then my, my dad was actually in, in the banking industry on board positions, and he told me, don't get into banking. It's really boring. So, okay. uh, <laughs> so I was like, okay. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, and then uh, you know, you came down, you, you got involved with it. So when you started in the glove distribution business, I mean, just selling, starting that safety business, it was originally just in your home country, in Nicaragua, right? Yes. Yes. So I started off, you know, I, I did everything. I was the warehouse guy. You know, I was totally bootstrapped. I really was just like ignorant of a lot of things. I was ignorant of, you know, managing a business. I was ignorant of accounting. I was ignorant of just so many things that was very hard for me to come to a place that was not made and did not give support systems for entrepreneurs, small business, and a host of other challenges as, as one starts their business. So I had to really learn everything on my own. And I had to start creating support systems around me. And what, a year and a half after I started my business, my father passed. So he was pretty much my only support system as far as local business knowledge. You know, my, my business Spanish wasn't even that good. So I had to, you know, really refine myself in so many ways. You know, it was a lot of trial and error. You know, university doesn't teach you how to be entrepreneur, at least they didn't back then. Taught you how to solve problems, but you had to get into problems on your own. <laughs> <laughs> that's very, very true. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, and again, you know, that's just always impressed me about you, you know, that you did. You really, you know, kind of jumped into this thing. You said, well, uh, I got to figure this out. Speaking of, you know, besides your, your father, I mean, where did you kind of figure out some of these systems? And where did you gather these systems from? Or did you find friends, family, you know, different people in the community? You know, the few uh, young entrepreneurs that were that were around back then here in Nicaragua that had come back from a life of exile. Uh, we had a whole generation leave because of the, of the Civil War. So as people started coming back from college and a few of us uh, ventured into becoming entrepreneurs, we started getting together and we started helping ourselves in meeting and and so I started becoming involved. Entrepreneurship took on a whole new uh, passion for me just because I, w I was a lone wolf, pretty much. And so we sought to seek help together and we formed an association of young entrepreneurs that is an organization that is all around Ibero-America. So that's all Latin America plus Spain and Portugal. Okay. And so I, we got exposed to other young entrepreneurs in that process. And then eventually I joined uh, Entrepreneurs Organization in yeah. 2009 and then eventually YPO in, uh, I think, 2013 or so. Mm -hmm. So I've always, as I mentioned before, I've had to create these support systems around me. And, and these entrepreneurial organizations have been sort of the bloodline for that, where I can yeah. give my time, give back to others, practice uh, leadership skills as well and also get uh, direct training on on how to become a, a better entrepreneur and a better leader as a whole. Absolutely, yeah. A lot of the uh, the clients I've worked with over the past, and my younger brother involved with YPO and the EO associate, you know, organization, you know, with the other friends of mine. And uh, absolutely, you know, these types of organizations really, they can galvanize you because you've got these other people that go through these similar struggles, you know, the same kind of issues that you deal with. Doesn't matter, you know, necessarily whether you're in the same business or industry, it's just you go through these struggles and these systematic struggles, personnel, family balance struggles, those types of things that you can really share some of these challenges with. Yeah, definitely. I mean, these organizations have the forum structure, so they're safe uh, environments where you can really open up, become vulnerable. And as a leader, that that has been one of my sort of go-to strategies always, is, and I've really practiced that over time and has led me to developing other other skills like public speaking and writing. I, I published my first book last year. And so these, these habits of, of really coming out and, and finding those emotions that are driving you or haunting you or weighing on you and these challenges being able to share those because it's lonely at the top when when you're an entrepreneur and many times we don't want to show our vulnerability to to other people much less our teams or or, or a spouse or anybody like that who depends on us so uh, we think those are usually signs of weakness and at the end of the day they're signs of true strength yeah as you said that safe environment you know you can share that with those folks and yeah I, I think that that's you know one of those things that many entrepreneurs they just make it harder on themselves they really do because they're unwilling to to ask for help ask hey look I don't know this you're not supposed to know it you know that's <laughs> yeah. it nobody nobody taught me that that I'm not supposed to know that and so yeah I you know, I think about, you know, launching this program, this is, I reached out to a lot of help because that's what you do. You, you need help to, to start these things. So, yes, I'd like to say I became a professional help asker. 
There you go. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I got to a point where I just said, you know what? I'm going to ask for a lot of help. That's right. It's just easier. It's just so yeah. much easier. So as you kind of built this uh, business and safety business, eventually it started to expand into other countries. You took on partners, if I remember right, and you had other areas in, in Central America. Yeah. So after 10 years, uh, our economy here was you know, growing at 2% one year, 4% another year, 1% another year. So it was really like going you know, two steps forward, three steps back, always politically influenced. And I was like, I've been at this for 10 years. If I would be in any other economy, I'd be selling 10 times as much. Mm -hmm. And I'd be, you know, that much more successful as a business. Before I know it, I'm going to have be here 30 years and not have much to show for. So I decided to get aggressive, decided to get ambitious. And I was at a point in my life where I was also sort of really developing myself and in personal development, because that's also another issue of mine. Mm -hmm. I've been, you know, active in personal development for over 20 years and sort of the limiting beliefs of, of the fact that I could do it. And I just started to do it. So what I did was I went on a road show. I got an idea, uh, one of those 3 a.m. ideas that you wake up and, <laughs> and write down in, a, in the book on your bed, bedside table. And I had the vision. And, uh, you know, I, I'm grateful to God that he gave me that vision. And I went on a road show searching for partners in the region. And uh, the idea was to create the first Central American safety corporation. Okay. And that's what I did about uh, a year and a half later. We were changing the names to about four current businesses at that time. I found two partners in two countries. And then we opened a fifth country under the new brand of Casco Safety, which is Central America Safety Company. Casco in Spanish being hard hat. Oh. So uh, it was a very nice play on words. It came out very elegant. And for the first three years, we were the darlings of the industry. We tripled our business. Uh, we grew at you know a really fast pace. And for that, I, I attribute a course that I did with EO at MIT called their Entrepreneurial Master's Program. Mm -hmm. So it really gave you the skills and the roadmap to scale a business. So that was super interesting. I applied a good deal of that and I was able to do that. And uh, we had great fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was really a great three years. And then what happened is that, you know, if I would know now after sharing some good times with Jason Bader <laughs> of certain business details back then, then it, wow, it, it would have been a totally different, different ball game. We started having some cash flow issues due to inventory management and improper purchasing. We were in five different countries. We thought that rolling this out, there'd be a lot of similarities in the markets and in demand of product. Then it wasn't wasn't the case. We were taking on a lot of new lines. So uh, we were on learning curves on lines and markets. So it was an expensive affair, if you can imagine. Sure. Uh, fast forward till now, I no longer have partners. I've downsized, operating in three countries in a format that I can manage very well on my own. Mm -hmm. And I think we talked about this at some point, you know, bigger isn't always better. Right. And, and definitely it's not always more profitable. So I think that I sleep a lot better at night now, and I think I'm more proud of myself of the business I have today than than maybe of the business that I had back then. So it's a, it's a roller coaster for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. I remember you know you sharing with me how big it got. Everybody said, "Oh yeah, take my line on here." Oh yeah, no, no, no here. Well, I'll give it to you. You don't have to, you don't even have to yes. pay for it. You know, and yes. then all of a sudden, you know, you're just teeming with all this inventory and a lot of different things. And no, it can be a little overwhelming. And actually, you know, it can definitely feed your ego. You're thinking, man, I'm great. I'm awesome. They, they love me. And it yeah. can be a very confusing time, you know, where I've seen this in a lot of other distributors where, you know, you are the darling at the time and people will say, oh yeah, we want to partner with you. And they will make you these incredible offers that you think, how can I pass up? Then it catches up with you and, and it becomes a very difficult situation to come out of. So for sure. Yeah. It took a lot of, a lot of money, uh, a lot of stress, a lot of painful nights, some really tough decisions, letting go of a lot of great people and teams. Yeah. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's a lot of, I, I like to get dramatic and say a lot of dreams crushed, but uh, <laughs> at the end it's, it's learning and it's inevitable. Things are going to happen. It's business and it's nothing personal, but you know, at the end of the day, we have to operate a business that's worthy of operating mm -hmm. for us to live a, a worthy life as well. Because if not, then uh, we're just living a lie. And as entrepreneurs, we need to be also investors 
real precise and have the ability to scrutinize your own business and not just fall in love with it. Because if not, it'll become a black hole. Oh, yeah, they, they definitely can be. But no, I'm glad that, you know, that you've got it down to at least a manageable size where you're able to, to get your arms around it. Quick little uh, kind of departure here. Your family's originally in the coffee business and uh, you've built this coffee empire of sorts, uh, you know, retail stores and, and everything. Tell me how uh, Cafe Las Flores is. So we've had some uh, coffee farms in the family for, for three generations now. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was my father's passion, you know, being yeah. the, the plantation and just beautiful environment Absolutely. and natural settings, just being in contact with nature. And for many years, uh, being a, a, a coffee plantation owner was a good business. Today and, you know, since about 20 years ago, when I started managing the farms and the properties, there was an international coffee price crisis, you know, much like there is today. Mm -hmm. Not nearly as bad, but right now it's around $93. Back then it got to like $60. And the cost of, of producing the equivalent price is over about 120 So oh. really, and, you, and when we look at the value chain in the coffee industry, the plantation owner is the one with the least margin. So it's really a tough business mm -hmm. and there's so many variables you cannot manage like the weather. Right. So, you know, little by little, we saw how difficult that was. And uh, we decided uh, with my siblings to get into ecotourism. And then eventually we decided to develop a brand little by little. And so we started doing this in the early 2000s. And uh, today we were fully integrated operation. We were full blown roasters, package and distribute. And we've also gotten into the retail side as well since mm -hmm. 2007. We've had to learn a lot of businesses. We've learned, you know, the plantation side. We've learned the roasting side. We've learned the distribution side. Mm -hmm. We've learned the food and beverage side. But it's been so fulfilling just because it's a, it's a family legacy. We've been able to build, you know, a Nicaraguan brand that's uh, recognized outside of our borders. It's such a creative business that going from distribution and, mm -hmm. and a, sort of like a real dry numbers business that has, you know, I really do like the variability of the safety side just because you get to see a lot of industries. Mm -hmm. But uh, the creativity on the coffee side allows my brain a real happy balance during the day. So, you know, uh, I'll go from one meeting of one business to the, the meeting of another business. So my brain gets to rest, actually, as I switch sides and get different types of Uh, of thought and creativity going in different different areas. So it's great fun and, and it's a great source of pride for our family. And we've been able to uh, get through this recent political and economic crisis also with significant downsizing and, and leaning of the business, making it leaner, waiting for better times here economically. Well, when, when I was down there, I remember, you know, we spent a lot of time in the You know, in the retail shops, you know, and they're, they're yeah. beautiful, man. They're, you all did a Thank fantastic you. job with it. Actually, if I remember right, uh, you uh, leaned on some of your uh, distribution principles to kind of tighten up uh, the menu, for example. Oh, yeah. We, well, we just launched a new menu a month and a half ago, and it was all based on what we worked on together, the hits categories and, and all, all that. So I applied all that to the food and beverage as well. And it applies to many businesses. So mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for that. You know, it's interesting, you know, this this dry numbers based business and distribution, you know, can actually go over and apply to this uh, your more creative retail side and more fancy retail side. So, well, you know, speaking of, of the family and siblings that you work with and, and you've got a lot of different moving parts in there, a lot of this comes back to your book you know, that uh, you wrote and, and really it's been kind of your passion for a long time is this building a legacy. Can you uh, share with us a little bit about that whole journey? Our family were originally from, from Italy, a fifth generation Italian here in Nicaragua. And uh, we have a family company that's still in operation founded in 1878. So a lot of family history traced back to both the old world and the new world. So having that sort of and growing up with that sort of like aura and that sort of stories and just a lot of reference to the old times and older generations you come up with a sense of not entitlement but responsibility is the way i've looked at it through my life where you're inheriting a, a name that has weighed and has been 
exemplified in, in many positive aspects. Mm -hmm. And so the least thing you could do is to honor those people that worked so hard for it for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And so you just try and really refine yourself little by little as a leader, as an entrepreneur, as a community contributor, as a family man, and, and as a leader of a family. So in all aspects of the word, I think legacy, which is the name of the book, how leaders transcend the past, balance the present, and serve for generations is something that, you know, obviously I hold dear and true. So, you know, it's pretty much that, finding your own philosophy of life. Mm -hmm. And that's what the book is. It's my first formal effort of putting into words in black and white my philosophy of life that I've gained in my age so far. And it won't be the last. I'm sure that philosophy <laughs> will will develop over time and sure. hopefully we'll, we'll publish a couple more over, over the next couple of years. Okay. You've been sharing this with audiences. You know, you've been speaking and doing some other engagements. How is that balance with uh, you know, your responsibilities in these other organizations? I mean, you've got a lot of, you know, a lot of different things going on right now. Yeah. My, my wife always says, uh, there's a saying in Spanish, you know, if you try and do so many things, you'll never screw the screw on tight on any of them. So, and I know that, but I would just get bored doing one thing. That's just me. In this process of, of developing organizations, you really get to learn how to uh, learn about people. Mm -hmm. And the most learning I've done is about myself. You know, I think I'm good at a lot of things and maybe I'm not excellent at any one of them, <laughs> but uh, I have a great time being good at a lot of things. So, you know, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that during this lifetime and hopefully in the next I'll focus on one thing. I re it's all about time management, focus, sure. priority. It's also related to how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be very conscious of our energy and uh, where that comes from and where it goes. And when we find energy drains, it's sort of like a financial drain. We have to be very quick to identify that and shut that off and be able to divert it into a place where you're really gaining energy from that. And so this whole process of legacy in this personal uh, project has been something that has given me a lot of energy. So I hope to continue to be able to share my message and, mm -hmm. and whoever it resonates with uh, have some great conversations about it. You know, it's interesting. As I shared with you, I, I actually did read your book. I got in and you know, read your book, my friend. I, you know, <laughs> thank you, Jason. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah. You and eleven others. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I got in. You know, but you talked about a transition from um, being a young man in business, and this is something you know I, I personally experienced as well. You know, being uh, more on the social side of the business, and uh, you know, spending too much time in that. And neglecting uh, perhaps family responsibilities. And, you know, if I recall correctly, you said that, you know, it really almost ruined you. Would you mind uh, you know, sharing a little bit about that? Yeah. When I was growing the business, I was traveling a lot. And, you know, my focus was very, was very egocentric. You know, I was just in, in, in that space. And so obviously that drew me away from certain other basic responsibilities and more present space, uh, not necessarily in a priority. And it was sort of the quality of my presence rather than my presence, my absolute presence. So, you know, relationship wise with my queen, I really just came to realize over time that, you know, it just, I, I wasn't giving her what she deserved. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I worked on that after many years of having bad habits, it takes some time to really clean up, clean up your house, clean up your own doo-doo. Mm. And so uh, you got to own it first. And if you'd never own it, you're never going to start cleaning it. It took me a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, heart to hearts. It took me a lot of third party education, a lot of personal development, a lot of courage also mm. in admitting my faults along the ways. And uh, we both grew. And that was, I think, the best part about it. Mm -hmm. Because when you grow alone and, and the other person is not growing in that key relationship, then it's going to be somewhat lopsided. And we decided to do it together. And uh, I think that's what really changed us. And we were able to develop common vocabulary, uh, reference ourselves, be able to identify things and understand where that identification comes from. Much more efficient to grow together than, than growing on your own. 
Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that common vocabulary. That was something that kind of stuck out for me that when certain, let's just say, you know, negative characteristics would come out, that if your partner has that ability to point those out in a way that can be taken uh, a little more lightly and maybe even cause humor oh, yeah, in for the sure. exchange, you know, rather than, you know, hey, you are then being escalating. A, right, yes, right. Yes, yes, no, yes, no, I, yes. I do appreciate that. And that's something that, you know, I think, again, you know, being young, being kind of thrust into these uh, responsible positions that if fairly young age that a lot of mistakes are made in that regard you know that you know you, you feel like you're you're doing the right thing by focusing so heavily on the business because you're going to be the breadwinner and you're am I not going the right path and then no definitely I mean there's is so many things that go through your head it's like why am I being questioned of doing this if this is for everyone else and then at the end of the day you ask yourself is it or if I do it poorly then what good is it so our brain is the most powerful and positive tool that we have. And at the same time, it's our biggest saboteur. So we have to really understand how to manage our mind and understand the sources of our fears and our doubts. Over time, the way I've been able to overcome that is through morning rituals that I'm extremely disciplined to that I, that I speak to in the book. They allow me the space to really reset my mind, my heart, my body every single morning. Mm -hmm. And that gives me the tranquility and the ease to be able to execute all day, slashing dragons at the office, mm -hmm. and then come back with the ultimate peace of mind and give the, you know, that quality presence that my family deserves. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend if you don't have a, a morning ritual that, that takes you to a place of gratitude, of being able to empower you in your body and in your mind, in your heart, and also be able to find spaces for your darkness of your fears, of your doubts, mm -hmm. of whatever holds you back, I highly recommend you find start finding a process to do that. It's never too late. Yeah, a friend of mine uh, refers to it as uh, doing your homework. You know, he he'd yeah. always refer to that. You know, hey, you know, when he found himself in a position where a lot of self doubt and a lot of um, anger or whatever it may be, you know, he he would always refer back to maybe I haven't been doing my homework. And that's, you know, getting back and, and kind of recognizing what is the most important thing and what's the thing that I'm really supposed to be working toward, not necessarily yeah. you know, feeding my ego. So exactly. Where can people find your book? How can they find <laughs> you? I mean, you, you're you the spiritual guru now, you know, I, I don't even know if I'm supposed to be even contacting <laughs> no. you anymore. So Come off, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, well, if you want to buy my gloves, visit cascosafety.com. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For the book, it's called Legacy and uh, it's on Amazon, a paperback and Kindle version. Mm -hmm. You can also find information at gmpalazio.com and follow me on Instagram as well or LinkedIn. Our coffee, if you want to order it anywhere, it's also on Amazon or we can ship direct from here from Nicaragua, from the origin. And that's cafelasflores.com. Yeah. And, and I'm going to tell you, for the listeners, you know, this is a very, you know, the coffee is fantastic. It is a cool, uh, cool brand here. I'm going to tell you right now from <laughs> personal experience. Thank you very much. Well, hey, my friend, you know, as always, just a pleasure to uh, get a chance to catch up with you. And I always like hearing about, you know, what's going on in your life and what's going on uh down in uh, Nicaragua and you know please give my best to your family it's always they were just fantastic when I came down uh, to visit thank you they remember you also with great memories as well and they always ask about the uh, Oregon Ducks Oregon Ducks well you know Oregon Ducks yeah, we'll see how they do you know how about those Patriots you know they can actually oh well we've had some some decent years recently yeah so. yeah a couple yeah a couple <laughs> you might lose a quarterback but I, no we don't know about that so uh, let's not get into those complicated issues <laughs> 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 all right my friend well hey you know always a pleasure i look forward to the next time we get a chance to talk thank you jason thank you for listening if you liked what you heard consider hitting that subscribe button links to sponsors products and services mentioned during this episode can be found in the show description area on your podcast application or at www.distributiontalk Com. Distribution Talk is edited and mixed by Andrea Clunder and Edwin Ruiz at the Creative Imposter Studios. This episode was brought to you by my company, The Distribution Team. We are a consulting services firm dedicated to helping wholesale distribution clients remove barriers to profitability, generate wealth, and achieve personal goals. To learn more about how we can help your company succeed, check us out at www.thedistributionteam.com.